The next panel we have is actually the, um, the who's who of um, the herbal medicine world. Um, what's so exciting about this panel is that as, as I've been learning more and more about this movement and industry, um, the individuals um, whose papers I've read, folks I've looked for their advice are all on this panel. Um, and I think you'll see there are a lot of parallels um, to the herbal medicine world, to some of the struggles that we're fighting now. So please welcome our next panel. Okay, good Hi everyone, my name is uh, Louis Grossman. I'm a professor of law at American University of Counsel at the law firm of Covington and Burling and a specialist in uh, food and drug law and my scholarly interest is on medical libertarian movements throughout US history. Uh, we have an extraordinarily accomplished panel with us today and rather than introducing them uh, uh, all now, let me introduce them seriatim as they come up. Our first uh, presenter is Dr. Lyle E. Cracker. Uh, Craker? Craker. Um, uh, who's going to talk about the early history of botanicals in the United States. Uh, Dr. Craker is a professor in the Department of Plant, Soil, and Insect Sciences at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, and since 2005, he's been trying to obtain a permit from the DEA to grow marijuana for research purposes. Dr. Craig. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for correcting my name. I always appreciate that. Uh, it's always, uh, it, the name is, uh, is a good English name. I'm surprised so many people sometimes uh, call it Cracker, but I answer to either, so just because that's the way it is. The, uh, I've uh, got used to that in grade school and, and uh, through high school and college, and still people are, are insisting, so that's okay. Uh, anyway, I'm really happy to be here because uh, uh, this is an exciting time. I'm really excited because uh, things are happening and we've been waiting for that a long, long time, it seems to me, uh, for at least uh, uh, quite a few years. And, and the years seem to drag on and drag on, but uh, maybe we're, we're making some advancement here that uh, that's really going to mean something. Uh, so, Steph, thanks very much for inviting me. I really appreciate that and uh, uh, glad to see all of you here. Um, well, I hope, guess this thing works. It does, that's good. Um, I wanted to, I was asked to give a, a kind of a brief history of what's been done with botanicals. Uh, not uh, uh, focusing on, on uh, cannabis, but instead looking at some of the other plants and trying to bring together for us a system of where we're going and how things have gone before. Some of the things that uh, are earlier speaker here talked about are some things that we need to look at and wonder uh, how to handle them and uh, that's sort of my objective here today to try and, and try and, and take a look at with, with for you. Uh, first of all uh, I thought we should have some definitions so that we know what we're really talking about. We need to when we're talking about medicines and we're talking about plant material uh, we need to know what we're talking about and, and I think that probably everyone here has some concept, uh, but when it comes down to actual things, sometimes uh, people get a little mixed up. So yes, we're talking about plants, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, medicines, and of course, we need to talk about the afflictions that uh, people deal with and where they're gonna use these plants, uh, and where they'll use it as medicine. Um, so that's, that's an important place to start. And once we have that uh, beginning, uh, I then come to the, uh, the thought process here that I've been teaching here for the last, uh, well, a few years anyway. I tell students that there are three things that when we, we have to think about when we, when we look at these things that, that associated with medicinal, medicinal plant material. And that is there's, a, there's a, a mythology that's associated with so many of our plants that they're good for this, uh, they, there's ceremonies that go with them, what, what do they mean and how they've been used. And these myths have carried uh, from historical times into the present. Uh, I frequently ask the students uh, uh, in reference to sage, how many, how many have a, a, 
a, uh, a sage, a bunch of sage hanging in their kitchen, and, and still some do. And of course, it means that it, uh, it's a happy household. But that's a myth. Myth. I don't think the sage itself causes a happy household, but it's certainly a myth. Uh, also, there is a, a tradition associated with many of these uh, plant materials that, that comes together, and uh, we have to think about historically how they've been used. Uh, and then there's science. And we live in an age of science. We live in an age of science is worship today. Uh, we kind of forget about the mythology, we forget about the uh, tradition, and we work with the science, and people want to see scientific proof for everything. Uh, that works and sometimes, and it's, it's okay. But uh, I found something new when I came to marijuana and talking about this, that there was some other thing besides myth and, and tradition and science, and that was something called the, the government. And the government's like a black cloud. It just overrules everything. It can overrule myth, science, and tradition completely. And, and that's something we've ran into here with certainly with and looking at cannabis uh, as, a, as a medicinal plant. Uh, I think there are some things we need to, to work with. And we're thinking about medicine. And I've tried to put together here a, a beginning of a little chart of some things that kind of tie off to the medicine. And if we, if we take a look at that, uh, we can see that medicine, uh, there's, uh, there's certainly some things associated with it that, that are important. And as we go forward, we, we need to keep these things in mind, that there are various roles that the government plays, there are various roles that advocates pay, play uh, on both sides of the fence. Uh, uh, these things are important that we, we keep them, we keep focused on them and recognize them and see them as something that we, that we need to work with. Uh, when we outline what we're going to, what going to accomplish. Uh, well, I'm supposed to give a brief history here of uh, plant material, and so uh, it's an introduction that maybe we can, we can start looking at that. I have uh, drew a, a circle here because uh, things seem to circle in life. They, they come and they go. Um, and I, the, uh, we're big, I wanted to begin back here with, with, with American history when people first came first came to uh, uh, the United States, came to America, I guess I should say. The Native Americans had, uh, had some medicines that they used, uh, much of it uh, to do with uh, uh, visions that they had, that they used, but certainly they used other plant material also. They knew a plant material that could help heal wounds because uh, they got scratches and had uh, tummy aches and, and uh, uh, other problems that we, we face in modern society. So we could start there. We move on to the people that came then, the settlers, the first ones here. Man, did they have it tough, huh? Landed here, landed in Massachusetts, as a matter of fact, and, and thank goodness the, uh, uh, the story goes, the, in, the uh, Indians that were there helped them, helped them survive. But uh, uh, they brought some plant material with them, of course, because they knew they needed medicine, but they had to forage in the wild. They had to learn uh, what would be good for them for American plants, so that's certainly a thing. And if we, we go past the settlers, then we have, then we have uh, uh, people here in the, in the uh, Revolutionary War, I thought was the next stage. And what was the medicine? Because whenever you have war, you have a lot of wounded, a lot of hurt people, and uh, to think about what they, what they would use. Uh, uh, so, and then we go on to, uh, just a circle here, the late, uh, the Civil War came, then the uh, uh, late 1800s, the early 1900s, uh, the 1930s to 40s, the 50s to 60s, the 60s, 70s to 80s here, wherever the 90s, 2000s, the present. This time passes on and everything gets closer together because things are happening uh, more readily. Well, if we start here with the early settlers, of course, the, the pioneers had these kitchen gardens. I mean, the wife usually did. Uh, the mother uh, had a garden outside of her kitchen door where she could gather uh, herbs for flavoring meals and, of course, herbs for, for helping to heal uh, different things. She grew those in the, right next to the kitchen door where she could get at them. In the, uh, in the, as we move on to the uh, Revolutionary War, they had opium. They had uh, ginger, they had squill. Uh, these, were the, these were the medicines that they had. Not much, uh, but certainly the opium could take away the, the pain, and of course that was important. If we then go to the Civil War, we find that most of the medicine was uh, 
bleeding and purging. Uh, the, uh, I don't think the bleeding helped the patients too much, uh, but uh, and the purging probably didn't help that much either. Uh, but certainly, uh, they, they did have some medicine, quinine, of course, coming from the uh, chinchona tree bark uh, to use uh, to help reduce uh, fevers. Um, they had uh, uh, amputation was a big thing. So these are, uh, these are things that kind of medicine that they had. If we move from the uh, Civil War to the late 1800s, late 1800s Opium uh, was a medicine. I mean, you could buy opium, uh, not uh, necessarily by prescription, but it was certainly available to, for people. And the other uh, medicines that were came in is during this time, during this time period, uh, meadowsweet and uh, willow bark as uh, pain relievers. Uh, and, but one of the things that did take place was the American Medical Association formed in 1847, and that became a very powerful political voice uh, that uh, still resonates today with us. Uh, if we go from there to uh, the 1900s, uh, the, the, the medical associations were, were classified into different ones. And they had practiced a different type of type of operation, not, not operations for cutting apart, but different uh, type of uh, medical practices that we had. This was a time of weaning out of, of the, in America of what type of uh, medical uh, system that we would have, uh, so that this is a this is a, these these uh, different ones, these different. I think we can look at it as a different. Uh, uh, practices that were, were tried. Uh, some have been more fortunate than others. Some have worked out better than others. And certainly that is, uh, that's something that needed to be done as we, as we weaned ourselves into a, a one type of, of medicine that we have. Uh, if we go on to uh, the 1930s, the 1940s, man, this was exciting because we had uh, vaccinations, uh, we began to develop uh, the antibiotics, uh, which uh, made such differences in, in the health of people. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, we take them as routine uh, now, to, uh, so that many of, the, many of the tragic diseases that went on uh, have, been, have been cured by this. So this is certainly a big step forward in medicine. Uh, going into the 1970s and 80s, we, we learned about government restrictions on some uh, things that uh, could pay with, with the passage of uh, uh, laws restricting the use of uh, marijuana, for example. And in the 1990s uh, uh, to 19, the 2000s, I looked at this as a, as a time of, uh, of change that went on, uh, that, we, that we began to look again at traditional medicines and come back to those. Uh, I, uh, if we look at that and we just look at the, uh, uh, what happened here, I tried to draw this uh, uh, loop so that we could, uh, could see what goes on. Uh, in the early part of the, of the uh, uh, time period here, in the less than the 1900s, it was acceptance of uh, uh, natural product medicines. Natural product medicines. Uh, everybody could use them. Everybody used them because that was primarily what they had. But as we progressed here along, we had a transition in the 1900s to 1940s uh, when the Flexner Report came out and uh, changed the, the scope of medical schools. We had this uh, more formal more formal type of medical association, uh, doctors being medical doctors being trained a certain way, so that uh, natural products began to disappear, began to disappear, because uh, they were getting a little, uh, not, I don't say a bad reputation, but uh, it was a movement time away from nature into more science, into more science, as opposed to traditional type of things. If you could demonstrate it, could do things, then it was worth, worth doing. But if we, if we continue on here into, into the 1940s and into the uh, early 1970s, uh, there began to be an abandonment of the, of the uh, traditional medicine entirely. Okay, it was pretty long, but then we, we abandoned it entirely until we came into the mid-1970s, 1980s, uh, beginning with the flower children in California who were dancing with flowers and, and, tr and using natural type of products. We had this, this, this 
new insight, new insight to look. And again, it was the population that began looking at this. Certainly this was fought by the American Medical Association uh, that uh, people using traditional medicine. I've heard so many stories about uh, patients telling, uh, uh, medical people telling me, the nurse telling me first, you know, that uh, uh, people are taking some natural products. Uh, they're afraid to tell the doctor because the, do the medical doctor will be angry. Uh, during this time period, they tell the nurse uh, because the nurse, you know, will, will be more accepting. They hope. So it was a time of transition here, transition here. And as we move on, uh, looking at the early uh, mid 19, mid nineteen nineties, so there's an acknowledgement that maybe there is something here. And as we progress through, we can see that in the integration in the nineteen nineties to two thousand, the medical doctors began to say it was okay to use medicines. And we've reached the point here where acceptance, acceptance of natural products, along with. Uh, tradition, the, uh, the synthetic medicines or the uh, modified medicines that we get. Um, well, just to show you some examples of what has happened here, I did a few surveys of literature. Um, I looked at uh, uh, ginkgo, for example, and uh, a, uh, a plant that has uh, medicinal properties uh, that is good for people. The, um, if we look at the literature, it, it has to do with uh, the, the uh, uh, use of ginkgo, in science, writing on ginkgo, very, very little in the beginning of the uh, 1980 there, hardly any articles, but as we move on, we can see there's a lot more science being done. Really people interested in this and, and people moving, uh, moving on to look at this as a natural, a natural product. Um, in, I also took a look here at, at uh, uh, at uh, looking at the, the African medicinal plants because uh, you know things come from uh, from different places in the world, and uh, again, very little in the beginning, uh, but again a rapid increase in the number of journal articles that have to do with these type of, of plant materials, which indicates to me again a large interest that science has been waiting to look at these, and now it's acceptable to to look at these. Um, the, uh, I did a same kind of search today, just to show you where we are. I did a search this morning on uh, uh, cannabis and uh, uh, journal articles, and I found a total of 24 uh, in a uh, Commonwealth Agricultural Bureau search as the others were done. So we're down, we're down at the lower part of the curve yet, but we're moving. We are moving and we're moving up, so more is going to, more is going to come. Um, well, if one takes a look at the U.S. Uh, pharmacopoeia and formulary, uh, a, lot of, a lot of plant medicines, as we're well aware, were used in the early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. But this uh, changed as we became more a, what we would call a Western type of medicine uh, with the uh, uh, emphasis on, on uh, science and the emphasis on uh, using uh, specialized products, antibiotics and, and uh, vaccinations, that we really decreased the number of plant materials being used in our, in our pharmacopoeia and formulary for the United States. But I'm also excited, kind of excited in a way, because it looks like to me, uh, and you, I think in the, in the 2000s, we've jumped up a little bit, right? We're getting back into some of the plant materials being accepted into the formulary and the uh, uh, pharmacopoeia. Uh, I'm uh, only up to 2007. Uh, I have some students working on the later years, though, because it's, this is exciting if, if we're really coming back to accepting some of these types of medicines uh, uh, as, uh, as units to, to be in our, our, our official, our official uh, list of medicines. Um, well, uh, I, I want to uh, emphasize uh, to you that there's, there's a lot of, lot of plants that are used, and we may not know that we use them all. These are, this is not a complete list. I checked, the uh, last time I checked, there were over 100 types of plant materials that are used in medicine or extracts from the plants are used in medicine. Uh, the common ones that most people hear of, of course, are foxglove, uh, which the uh, original extract came from the foxglove plant to, to increase the, the power of the heart as it pumped blood through, uh, uh, blood through the body. 
uh, and prevent uh, edema. I mean, the swelling of the body, uh, uh, if you look at any uh, books, they like to put uh, pictures of the uh, people back when the, before this plant was discovered by uh, Dr. Withering. Um, they let them, laid them on a bed of nails, and, and so they bleed. And of course, that was the wrong thing to do because it was, uh, they thought they had too much blood in them. Uh, well, that takes care of it, I guess. You put them on a bed of nails, and, and uh, maybe you sit on them too. I don't know. Uh, but uh, instead, uh, we know now that the, the, the heart uh, gets enlarged because it, uh, it needs to pump more. And certainly, the, uh, the use of uh, foxglove has helped. But we have other medicines. About 100, over 100, 100 plants that just commonly show up being used. Um, that brings us to something we need to discuss in talking about any type of plant material that we're going to use, and that's a balance. A balance between the medicinal use and the recreational use. And certainly that's true in cannabis, and we're going to have to face that. We're going to have to decide how we're going to face that. Uh, are we going to encourage both? Are we going to encourage one? Are we going to down one? I don't know, but that's certainly something that we need to think about because recreational use of any drug is frowned upon in this country, whether it's uh, cannabis or something else. Uh, but if it's used for medicine, then people are uh, can sometimes okay it. So that uh, that bridge will need to be need to be crossed here and see which way the it goes. Well, the uh, uh, just to try and look at this again, the, the, uh, the current drug system we have is not, not perfect. Uh, you can see that the death toll uh, from misuse of pharmaceuticals uh, does occur. Uh, this, the thing I looked at told me a death every 19 minutes in the U.S. from misuse of, of, of medicine. Um, well. What we have to decide here, I guess, is uh, when we're thinking about all this, I tried to illustrate that here. We have, we have this alternative, uh, which we're trying to get away from, and going to this alternative, which we're trying to look forward to, and hoping that uh, everything works in, in this direction. And it will, I think, if we take a, a close look at everything. Um, I did want to tell you that puppies are for hugging. Uh, pup puppies are fun, nice. But there are some plants that are dangerous, and we should be aware of those. Uh, if we're, if we're, the law becomes acceptable to marijuana, some of you may want to look at other, other plant materials that are kind of illegal to use, uh, but we need to be careful, and uh, uh, there's a list there. I put them in red to warn you we don't want to work with those. Um, I think it's time, or I think it's happened, uh, I come back to my to come back to my mythology and my tradition in science, and I, I wanted to throw away the, uh, the, the uh, not approved by the U.S. Department, uh, uh, by the U.S. government, uh, because I think we've, we've reached that here with, with, with uh, uh, cannabis. I think we're, we're, we're looking at now what we can look at. Um, well, myth, just to give you an example of myth uh, so that everybody understands, uh, golden seal I picked on. Myth is it helps you uh, cover up for uh, using uh, illegal drugs. Uh, that's a myth. It doesn't do anything for you that way. Uh, science, we know it's an antimicrobial uh, type of uh, compound with possible cardiovascular effects. And then we have uh, uh, Tradition uh, from the U.S. and it's been used uh, for a long time to help with inflammation and, and uh, it's a bitter tonic and that. So uh, we have those things that, that go on. Um, I don't think we want to go back to this. Uh, uh, this is the, the beginning of, 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 of pharmacy. Uh, this, I took this picture in Nigeria and uh, this is their drugstore and you can see uh, natural products. Uh, I think we're beyond that. Uh, and probably we don't want to go back to that. Uh, here's what I see as, as the perfect uh, solution that we have the pharmacists and the herbalists working together uh, to uh, help with uh, uh, natural medicine and the conventional medicines uh, so that we, we working together, a partnership, we can provide the best health care that is possible. Thank you. Sure. 
Our next speaker will be my dear friend and partner in crime and other things, uh, Peter Hutt on No Crime. Uh, Peter is uh, senior counsel at Covington and Burling. He is considered to be the dean of the FDA bar. He was chief counsel of the Food and Drug Administration uh, in the early 1970s where he was involved in the, uh, the drafting of much important food and drug uh, legislation and regulation. He has continued doing so um, in private practice ever since. And he's gonna be describing for us the political movement surrounding the passage of the very important Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. Thanks, Peter. I'm delighted to be with you this morning and particularly to be reunited with my longtime friend, Jim Tozy. Uh, we were both in government at the same time and uh, often interacted. He had more power than I did, but that was all right. I'm gonna give you a very quick history before I specifically talk about the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994 because you need to know the context of how that statute uh, arose. And it goes back literally 100 years. As Lyle had pointed out, botanicals have been used throughout history for two separate and distinct purposes. One is as medicine. And the second is traditional medicine, Lyle, you said. I think that's a good term for it. The second is as an item of food. Don't ever forget that for centuries, the Chinese have used botanicals to make tea. And both of those have been assimilated into our culture. Our first national statute regulating both uses of botanicals was the Federal Food and Drugs Law of 1906. And it was not long after enactment of that statute that FDA began to be concerned not just about botanicals, but about the entire category of what we now call dietary supplements. Throughout the 1920s, FDA brought serious enforcement action against this category. Then in 1938, a new federal statute was enacted, our current Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and that gave FDA greater power, again, to regulate both the traditional food supply and traditional medicine as well. Following World War II, FDA launched the greatest enforcement action in its history against the dietary supplement industry in the 1950s. When that failed to dim the future of dietary supplements, in the 1960s they switched from court enforcement to administrative enforcement, culminating in a literally two-year-long administrative hearing that would have basically reduced the number of dietary supplement uh, uh, products in the country to virtually nothing. That was what united the dietary supplement industry. And they fought back against it in the courts where they won and in Congress where they gained a partial victory in 1976. Things for a decade seemed to be stabilized. FDA didn't do very much. But then a very critical statute was enacted in 1990, the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, which authorized FDA to establish health claims for food. And food includes both dietary supplements, and conventional food. The FDA commissioner at the time, Dr. David Kessler, made a terrible strategic error. 
he decided this was the moment that he could put a wooden stake through the heart of the dietary supplement industry. As I will describe, he put a wooden stake through the heart of FDA instead. He is solely responsible for an act enactment of what I will describe in one moment, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. He announced in 1993 that he was going to take all dietary supplement ingredients, that included botanical ingredients, off the market as illegal food additives. I'm not going to go into the details of the food additive provisions of the law. This galvanized the industry even more than they had been galvanized in the late 60s and early 70s. And there ensued the, what has often been described as the largest and most effective grassroots political campaign in American history. If you went into a health food store in 93 or 94, you would have found the one entire wall was plastered with campaign slogans. Call your member of Congress, write your member of Congress. They're trying to take our freedom away to choose the kind of dietary supplement that we wish to consume. And this wasn't a, uh, <clears throat> you know, a large pharmaceutical campaign or even a large uh, food industry campaign. This was grassroots. And Jim Tozy will tell you there is nothing in this country as effective as a grassroots campaign. So what did they do? One of the things they did was to get those letters to Congress. In 1993 and 1994, there were more letters to Congress about the right to take dietary supplements than about war, peace, the budget, the right to life, or any other subject. It was extraordinary. The second thing they did is, please recall, 1994 was the year that the Republicans took over the House and Senate for the first time in 40 years. And so what the dietary supplement industry did was to line up their members, find out who would be in favor of a new law for dietary supplements, who would not support it, and anybody running for office who would not support it, there was a member of the industry in every single speech so that they would be heckled and the audience would find out that they did not support any type of new legislation. About a month before the election in the fall of 1994, the two principal opponents of any new legislation, Henry Waxman of California and Teddy Kennedy uh, in the Senate of Massachusetts, called the industry and said, we give up. Let's sit down and write a law. And that led to the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. Now, the enactment of a law, as Jim Tozy said, doesn't mean all issues are over. New issues arise. But without that law, there would have been no protection for dietary supplements. And my uh, colleagues are now going to describe, Tony Young will describe how that law has been implemented by FDA since then. Another interesting aspect of the movement leading to Deshay, which also has echoes in the mar marijuana legalization movement, is the bipartisan nature of some of the support that uh, the dietary supplement uh, industry received. For example, 
On the one hand, Orrin Hatch was a big supporter of Deshay. On the other hand, Tom Harkin and Bill Richardson were also. So this is, uh, I think, an interesting characteristic. So Tony Young is going to be describing to us uh, the inflammation of uh, the Im inflammation, the implementation <laughs> of Deshay. Uh, um, Tony uh, is a very esteemed lawyer at the uh, great food and drug focused law firm of Kleinfeld, Kaplan, and Becker, where he's been since 2003. He represents food, drug, and dietary supplement uh, manufacturers, and he currently serves as general counsel to the American Herbal Products Association. Tony. Thank you. Um, uh, just a footnote on how politics works. Deshay was coming up uh, before the Senate, and Howard, uh, I think it was Howard Metzenbaum, was the uh, congressman from Ohio, a consumer advocate, someone who you would have, uh, would have seen as someone against uh, dietary supplements. Um, and uh, he had a block on the bill. And the bill was released by Metzenbaum uh, when Senator Hatch released a hold on two Court of Appeals judgeships uh, that were uh, judges uh, from uh, Ohio to the Court of Appeals. So that's how power, uh, politics works. Metzenbaum went on to become head of the Consumer Federation uh, of America. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the regulated industry. Uh, regulation is tough. Uh, Lyle, if you ever get that uh, license to grow marijuana and use it, you, like Iklas Khan down at the University of Mississippi, will be able to spend half your time filling out paperwork for the DEA. Uh, I met with DEA in Oxford once, and uh, at the end of the meeting, I said, do you know Iklas Khan? And they said, do we know Iklas? He provides us with more paper to review than anyone else. So under the Duché, herbs and botanicals, were written into the law specifically as a form of dietary ingredient along with vitamins, minerals, various other items, amino acids in particular, because FDA in that, 19, uh, in that 1993 attack singled out botanicals, singled out amino acids, so they carefully were placed into the statute. So, FDA then had to implement these uh, regulations uh, or the statute. The first thing they did was establish uh, supplement facts, uh, identity, and nomenclature regulations. Well, what does that mean? It means you, on a supplement facts uh, uh, panel, you will see the various nutrients and the various ingredients uh, that are in the supplement in a very uniform presentation, in a uniform amount, based on the serving size determined by the company. They established requirements for botanical names and that the part of the plant of the botanical be uh, listed. Very important so that people can understand what the botanical is that they're getting and whether the part of the plant of the botanical, for those who, who know enough, is the part of the plant that is expected to have uh, to do something uh, for you. And the name of the dietary supplement has to be named, either dietary supplement, botanical supplement, vitamin supplement, again, to identify what these things are. And that's very important. Think about that in the context of, of the products uh, that you're looking at. It allows product comparisons uh, to be made by medical professionals and consumers through standardized terminology. It allows strength and potency of products to be compared, um, and it requires also labeling of other ingredients in the products, something very important. Consumers want to know, well, what else have you, what else have you used in here? Um, FDA then, in the next round, uh, established claims or uh, established regulations for structure function claims for dietary supplements. Prior to Deshay, you really couldn't make a structure function claim for a food product, remember everything was a food before, unless that claim arose out of the nutrient value of the, uh, of the ingredient. And 
botanicals were not thought to have any kind of nutrient value. That's a very defined term uh, in the law. And so we didn't get many claims at all out of prior law. So Deshay allows us to describe how a botanical is intended to affect the structure or function of the body. And that is a huge allowance for botanicals because that is what they do. That is what many things do on their way to being drugs, but we only get to go on the highway. We don't get to go to the end point of drug or disease. That's precluded for dietary supplements. So FDA proposed a bunch of regulations and discussed what kinds of claims could be made for supplements. Uh, they expanded the definition of disease. Remember, under Deshay, you can't make a disease claim, so they made that universe larger so that you couldn't, couldn't go there. They said that many common conditions of health are diseases. Um, they said there's no structure function claim allowed where the, there is an over-the-counter uh, drug claim either regulated or prohibited in the OTC drug regulations. They said no disease markers uh, like high cholesterol, no implied claims, and no reference to published articles ab about disease. So they started off giving us a very narrow window for structure function claims. The industry then files comments on the proposed regulation. That's part of the regulatory process. And at the end of the day, FDA agreed that common health conditions are not diseases. That would be the menses, um, menopause, uh, and, and other common uh, conditions. Pain after exercise, after strenuous exercise, but not arthritis pain. They allowed many OTC claims as structure function claims. We basically gave them a list of the claims that had been prohibited or allowed for OTC drugs, and we said, we think these are structure function claims. I think we gave them 60, we got about 40. That was pretty good, because these were all drug claims, many of them not allowed for OTC drugs, because there had been no demonstration of safety and efficacy in the drug context. But now we're allowed to make claims, and the category that grew the largest out of this is aphrodisiac products. Um, well, you got to start somewhere, I guess. Uh, and why not start at the beginning? Uh, so, <laughs> nutritive-based uh, uh, claims um, must bear the, these claims must bear disclaimers. No implied claims. No disease markers. They didn't. They didn't give us those. Um, they, as I said, they gave us many uh, claims, including uh, pain relief. Um, and, uh, and, they, and the big holding was just because something is prohibited as a claim for a drug does not mean that it's prohibited as a claim for a supplement if it is a structure function claim. Um, we also have some health claims under NLEA, uh, the uh, Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, that apply to our products, calcium and osteoporosis, folic acid and neuro, neural two defects, and uh, stanol sterols uh, for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. And those are important products uh, in the industry. Um, the benefits of these kinds of regulation is that it, it established the parameters for people to operate under. Uh, it does require that the laws or that the claims be substantiated, which is something that FDA does not really enforce. But it is something that is now, in the last, say, four years, being enforced by consumer uh, plaintiff's lawyers suing on behalf of consumers in states where there are consumer protection laws that allow those states. That has become a big issue uh, in the industry. Um, and I hope as you're listening to me here, you're saying, what about us? Because that's why we're uh, uh, bringing you this uh, information. Uh, we had a botanical that was a huge seller even before Deshay passed. It was used for weight loss products. It's ephedra. It's a very good herb. It is the herb that gave you the drug ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, uh, and, and other drugs of that nature. 
uh, because what the pharmaceutical di companies did is they first marketed these as botanical drugs. And you can find that in the old US pharmacopoeias. But what they wanted was consistency. They always wanted the same product. And uh, a chemistry set gets you there. And so they created the drug forms, uh, the synthetic organic chemistry forms of these various uh, uh, plant parts. Um, we met with FDA repeatedly, the industry did, we tried, we went to advisory committee meetings, uh, we, we had expert uh, uh, physicians uh, uh, doing testimony for us. Uh, we thought we could reach an accord with FDA, uh, but we were not able to. There was no consensus. And so FDA banned uh, ephedra from dietary supplements uh, in uh, 2003 after a very long uh, rulemaking. What did we have, what lessons? Uh, botanicals are psychologically, or physiologically active, uh, just like uh, drugs. Uh, no wonder you get a little kick if you take an ephedrin uh, or ephedra uh, weight loss product. That's why they sold. You could feel you were taking something. You don't feel vitamins and minerals usually. Uh, the failure uh, of the industry to reach agreement uh, led to the rulemaking ban, uh, and many, many companies made tons of money in this business. And then they lost tons of money, and most went bankrupt uh, after product liability suits alleging injury uh, bankrupted uh, the companies. Um, there was one other case that, that is important. Uh, there was a case uh, regarding red yeast rice. Red yeast rice was a product uh, formulated by uh, at least one company very carefully. They patented it. They said it was new. It was different. And it was a drug. It was a, a uh, supplement ingredient that was designed to deliver lovastatin uh, in a way that would help lower cholesterol. Well, the problem was Merck had a drug, Mevacor, that contains lovastatin, and they were promoting this red yeast rice at half the dosage of lovastatin, um, and or Merck's Mevacor, and there's a provision in the Dietary Supplement Act that says you cannot have a dietary supplement where there's an approved drug in the category. So uh, that uh, red yeast rice uh, came off the market in that driven form formulated uh, to uh, control the amount of, um, of lovastatin. Uh, lesson, uh, there are, as I understand it, there are ingredients being uh, researched for uh, epilepsy in children, and there are drugs being researched with those same ingredients, epilepsy for children. Consider that there may be two locomotives going uh, towards each other in that context. Uh, that's what happened uh, with lovastatin and Mevacor. CGMPs for dietary supplements, that was in the original uh, statute. FDA was empowered to create these regulations. The industry early on, I think in 1997, petitioned FDA for those kinds of regulations, but it was a long time before FDA got around uh, to doing it uh, or to promulgating those regulations. They are extraordinarily detailed. They take up many, many, many more pages in the Code of Federal Regulations than the comparable regulations for prescription drugs or any kind of drugs. Uh, they are extraordinarily de detailed, and FDA is now using those um, CGMPs, especially with respect to uh, uh, botanicals, uh, to enforce against the botanical industry and other companies uh, within in the industry. Uh, because they can really get down into the manufacturing processes of, of the uh, companies. Uh, the burdens on botanical manufacturers are significant. But think about it in your context. Ingredient uh, identification. Is it cannabis or is it grass clippings? Uh, that's important for your customers. It's important for your business. Microbial adulterants. Plants carry microbes. Microbes carry disease in some cases. Uh, sanitation in the facility. 
composition of the finished product, record keeping to assure that everything was done to keep the product within in boundaries. All of those are very, very important items that you all need to think about going forward. Um, we also have, in, in 2003, the American Herbal Products Association proposed uh, regulations uh, to establish serious adverse event reporting uh, for dietary supplements because pharmacovigilance, knowing what's happening in the patient population out there, is very important to tracking uh, uh, the use of items, especially the use of products in sick people. And we're talking medical marijuana in here. It's very critical. Um, Jane will talk about the law that was passed. Eventually, Congress agreed and passed a law requiring adverse event reporting. Um, here are some issues that you all, I think, are gonna confront that the dietary supplement industry is currently confronting. Supplements for animals. We don't, there are no supplement category for animals, yet if you go into a PetSmart or other place, you'll see a huge amount of products in this category. Conventional food forms, bars and drinks. Is it a supplement or is it a, um, is it a food? And with, with respect to what you all do, when you put it in a food, what happens? We have laws on that subject. Um, combinations of dietary supplements and OTC drugs, something that's never been allowed, but I wouldn't be surprised to see people trying to put combinations of cannabis products uh, with OTC drugs. Warning labels and precautions. Oh my goodness, you really are supposed to tell the doctor and the doctor is supposed to evaluate whether or not the product is safe for the patient. You do that through warnings, precautions, and other information. Very, very important. Is it safe for use in children and pregnancy? Is it safe for use in mo nursing moms? All of these are important questions. So be careful out there. Your products have to be safe. Don't test your new and improved products in your customers. That is not something we really do in an advanced country like the United States of America. You shouldn't be doing it. Safe and truthfully labeled products will keep the plaintiff's lawyers and the plaintiffs from smoking you because that's what they will do when they see how much money is out there on the table. When the state of Colorado publishes how much tax money they are getting from this industry, you can be sure that there are plaintiff's lawyers looking, uh, looking at that and saying, how can I take some of that money and put it into my client's pockets if they've been injured out there. So you have your state governments, you have your federal government, but remember there is the no government uh, lawyer bar that can be a big problem for your industry. Thank you. A question that I think that a lot of you probably are thinking right now is, uh, what is the direct relevance of Deshay to the whole line of cannabis products? And just before I bring uh, Jane up here, I just want to point out that the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act is limited to ingested products. So it doesn't apply to topicals, it doesn't apply to nasal products, doesn't even apply to a lozenge that's applied under the tongue that delivers the active ingredient directly into the bloodstream, at least according to FDA. And last year, or two years ago now, I guess, there was a product called AeroShot, which some of you may be aware of, which was an inhaled caffeine product that tried to market itself as a dietary supplement, and FDA sent them a warning letter saying that is not a dietary supplement. In any event, um, to, to, to finish our, our presentation today, um, we are uh, privileged to have Jane Wilson, who, who will be talking about legislation post Deshaies. Um, Jane is the Director of Program Development for the American Herbal Products Association. Since joining uh, the staff of the uh, association in 2013, Jane has been providing support to the association's Cannabis Committee. Um, and prior to joining uh, the association, she served as Director of Standards for NSF International, a global private sector public health organization. And again, she's going to describe post Deshaies legislation. Thank you. Uh, 
I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which has always had a fairly liberal attitude for marijuana, and I want you to know I'm missing out on the hash bash, which is taking place today. <laughs> Go blue. <laughs> but this promises to be much more fun, I'm sure. So, uh, For those of you who may not know uh, who, who APA is, we are a trade association for the herbal products industry. Uh, we have about 300 member companies, and they represent the, the full spectrum uh, of the herbal products industry from herb herbal growers to processors to retailers and distributors. Uh, we also represent uh, analytical laboratories and other types of service providers that uh, provide different uh, types of services to this industry. And in uh, 2010, we did form a cannabis committee uh, that started to work on cannabis issues. We've uh, partnered very closely with ASA and, and uh, AHP, who recently put out the uh, cannabis monograph on those efforts. And uh, Tim Smale, who I think is here in the audience somewhere, is the uh, chair of that committee. Let's see if I can get this to work right. Okay. Uh, so the topics I'm going to be covering today, I've actually got a couple different areas. We're going to look at some, some of the post de FDA uh, regulatory and legislative actions that have happened. Uh, but I thought it would be interesting to also talk about some other initiatives that do impact um, herbal products, uh, both internationally and in the United States. Uh, so with that, I will jump into the adverse event reporting. Uh, so as Tony mentioned, there was an act passed in 2006, the long title being the Dietary Supplement and Not Prescription Drug Consumer Protection Act, and it became effective uh, one year later in 2007. And essentially, this, this formalized this concept of pharmacovigilance for the dietary supplement industry. And I wanted to point this out that the, uh, the work of the APA Cannabis Committee has been to establish recommendations for regulators across the supply chain of the cannabis industry. So we've, we currently have recommendations for um, cultivation and processing, dispensaries, and laboratory practice, and are, are completing one for the manufacturing sector. And the uh, uh, cultivation, uh, dispensary, and manufacturing documents all contain an element of adverse event reporting or, or a foundation for that uh, pharmacovigilance uh, activity within the cannabis industry. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be challenging for a while because you do have 20 odd different systems that are uh, divided up amongst the states and all those systems are a little bit different. And, uh, but to, to at least create the foundation where the, the industry is starting to take note of this information. Uh, will help you moving forward as uh, more states transition and, and maybe essentially there'll be a federal uh, solution too. So when we talk about adverse event reporting uh, for the dietary supplement industry, the, the, the law requires that there be a responsible person who's designated to accept reports of adverse events. And an adverse event is defined as uh, an event that is medically related that is adverse after somebody takes the product. So I don't know about you, but I really hate definitions that use the same words that, <laughs> that you're defining. Uh, it doesn't really help me out a lot. Uh, but there are also something called a serious adverse event. So if you, if you get one of these outcomes here, if you die or if you're in the hospital, have a life-threatening experience, or there's intervention needed to make sure that you don't go into one of these categories, that's uh, defined as a serious adverse event. And those are ones that have to be reported to FDA within a 15-day period. So short title of this one is Bioterrorism Act. Um, it has a much longer title that I had not committed to memory. Uh, suffice to say that this started the process of facility registration for companies that manufacture dietary supplements. So post 9-11, Congress recognized the need to have further protections for the food supply within the United States, as well as the water supply and also restricting access uh, of uh, biological agents that could be used as um, terrorist, uh, in terrorist activities. So the, this act requires that food facilities, and this does include the dietary supplement uh, manufacturers, to register their facility with FDA. This includes domestic uh, facilities as well as foreign facilities. And then there must be advance notice of the import of food products uh, into the United States uh, to the FDA. So since Deshay came into effect, there's also been many sort of individual enforcement actions on specific botanicals that have been taken. 
Uh, so a lot of these have well-known uh, toxic compounds uh, within them. As Lyle mentioned, not every plant is our friend, and some have developed chemical constituents that are actually protective factors so that somebody doesn't eat them. Uh, a couple that I'll talk about in a little more detail in the Aristolochiaceae species. Cannabis is much easier to say than that, but uh, this is a, a good example of where pharmacovigilance comes in. Uh, there was a, a series of um, women in Europe that developed a very specific type of kidney cancer, and medical researchers realized that the development of this cancer was uh, connected to the fact that they were using a uh, traditional medicine slimming product for weight loss, and it did contain aristolochic acid. And so that was linked to the disease that they manifested. Uh, Tony talked about ephedra, so I won't talk about that one in detail. One of the most recent actions was with kratom. Um, FDA at the end of February issued an import restriction for kratom. Uh, they concluded that there was no evidence of safe use of this particular herb, and an NDI or a new, a new dietary ingredient notification would have to be filed um, to establish any safe use of that product. The Dietary Supplement and Labeling Act, and this is something that's been proposed a couple of times, but has not come uh, into fruition as a, a, re a regulation. And this provides for or going beyond facility registration, which was under the Bioterrorism Act, to the level of product registration. So right now there's no pre-market notification needed for dietary supplements if a, a company's putting a new product on the market. This particular act would seek to establish that as well as uh, additional labeling requirements beyond what's currently required by Deshay. And this was introduced by um, Senator Durbin from Illinois in 2011. And as, as Peter mentioned, the, the industry is very good at mobilizing <laughs> itself when it wants to advocate against something. And so that was successfully um, defeated in 2011. Uh, the senator did reintroduce this bill in 2013. Uh, no action has been taken to date. Uh, there was some thoughts that he would try to slip provisions of it into other legislation, such as the farm bill that recently passed. That hasn't happened uh, yet, but uh, we continue to be vigilant and, and see what further action uh, Senator Durbin might take with this. So switching gears a little bit to look at things that are non-FDA. Um, how many people are here from California? So you're probably pretty well versed in Proposition 65 and see a lot of the warnings all over the place. Uh, so this was adopted as a ballot initiative almost 30 years ago. And uh, the state essentially maintains a list of chemicals that it cons considers that are known to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. And this could be through exposure to a, a product or exposure to a service, like a, being at the gas station or being in a parking garage or a movie theater. And uh, I just wanted to note that marijuana smoke was added to that list in 2009. Uh, but this law requires that a person doing business in California has to provide a clear and reasonable warning if there's going to be an exposure to any of these chemicals on this list. And there's about, I think, between 800 and 900 chemicals um, that are currently on the list. And some of the unique uh, aspects of this particular law are, is that there's government enforcement as well as private citizens can bring enforcement action. Uh, and the plaintiff is not actually required to demonstrate that there's harm caused by the product or service. Uh, and all the burden is placed on the defendant to demonstrate that their product uh, does meet the requirements of the law. So just some examples of the warnings that you would see uh, having to do with Prop 65. The uh, text warning, that's a pretty typical generic warning that you might see on a consumer product. Uh, if you go into Starbucks, you'll see that they have warnings posted because there's a tiny amount of acrylamide that might be present in your coffee or in your baked good that you might buy there. Um, Disneyland has postings about the fact that uh, there's a warning for Prop 65. And then apparently just random places by the side of the road they put signs. <laughs> so there's not even room to pull over and read what that says. So. <laughs> but... Uh, OEHA, which is the state agency that uh, oversees Prop 65, just recently um, proposed some pr pretty sweeping revisions to the labeling requirements, uh, and those are currently under comment right now. And uh, it would 
severely impact a lot of the consumer products, but particularly dietary supplements, if those went into effect. So I'm sure we'll be mobilizing again and providing comments on that. Uh, so in terms of herbal products in Prop 65, uh, what's been most problematic for the industry is the compliance with some of the heavy metal requirements that are um, uh, listed on, on the list, uh, listed on the list, yeah. Um, obviously herbs grow in soil and soil naturally has lead and other heavy metals in it. These are also ubiquitous in the environment for other man-made activities uh, like lead gasoline and, and lead um, pesticides which are not used anymore but are, are uh, residuals in the environment. So the plant uptakes the uh, metals and it remain, may remain in there as the plant is processed into a dietary supplement. But lead has probably been the, the biggest uh, problem uh, for, for herbal products just because the level that's allowed under a safe harbor in terms of Prop 65 is extremely low at, at 0 0.5 micrograms per day. So looking at some of the toxicity research that's done on uh, herbals and uh, you know, Lyle talked about some of this and we, we, we want to encourage uh, reputable organizations to do research on herbals because there's certainly data gaps that need to be filled and, and uh, you've seen that there's been growing interest and in, in additional citations coming out in the literature. Uh, in the United States, the National Toxicology Program, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, has done several of their studies on uh, herbal products. And the four that I have listed here, they've all been classified as possible human carcinogens uh, based on the, the results of, of NTP studies. And in the case of aloe vera, the test article that they used was a, a non-decolorized uh, type of, of aloe vera, which is known to contain some uh, toxic chemicals. And it's not representative of what is available in the marketplace in terms of a commercial aloe product. Uh, similar with, with ginkgo, they used a very specific ginkgo extract that essentially represents only a single product that's on the market and, and is a very unusual one. Uh, with golden seal, there was a single liver tumor in one rat <laughs> that, that brought about the uh, classification for that particular herbal. Uh, in, in APA's research into that, it looks to be within the historical norm for that particular rat to maybe have an occasional liver tumor, but, but that's kind of fallen on deaf ears. And, and the, the, the issue is that these results then get fed into other forms. They go into things like Prop 65. They go into the um, IARC, which is the International Agency on Research with Cancer, and get aggregated with, with other studies. And, uh, you know, another thing that we've noticed is Many times these studies will observe protective effects of the herbal test article, but you really don't hear about that part. You just hear about the one tumor that they found in this one rat. Um, CITES, now this is thinking about herbs as an endangered species, which you probably don't have to worry about for cannabis so much, but uh, there are a lot of herbs where they have been not sustainably harvested and there are uh, endangered populations either in the United States or in other countries. So CITES is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, and its goal is to protect uh, endangered species, both plants and animals, that are entered into commercial trade. And this is legal commercial trade, not uh, anything that's been poached or taken illegally. And uh, there are three levels of protection depending on how endangered that particular species is, is uh, perceived to be. And many botanicals that have traditional medicine or dietary supplement uses um, are on these lists, and I've put a few examples of that on there. Uh, so essentially, to comply with the requirements of CITES, uh, somebody who's importing or exporting a product that contains one of these herbals has to comply with permitting processes that are administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and um, USDA. So just wrapping up, and I hope I'm maybe summarizing a little bit for the panel too, but um, you know, I think we've presented that there's a very rich history of verbal medicine use um, in the United States, and there's certainly many lessons learned that hopefully the cannabis industry can leverage um, as you transition back into legal status. Uh, Self-regulation, uh, that, that's what the herbal industry has, has uh, it's been our goal for, for years to uh, you know, ensure the safety of our products, um, submit to things like pharmacovigilance, um, 
looking at interaction with regulators. This is really the uh, purpose of the, the documents that we've been submitting or developing through the Cannabis Committee is to be able to give them something and have that conversation with the regulator and say, you know, this is what we feel are best practices. Um, please look at this and adapt it uh, for your needs. And then legislative engagement. I think that's all about what, what's going to happen um, at this conference on Monday. So I think all of these elements are going to be uh, talked about and, and discussed and, and engaged in over the next three days. So it's, it's really an exciting um, conference. And I will turn it back over to Lewis. So please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for a fascinating presentation.